Um, the title for my talk today was Ideas Stimulated by Extreme Events. Now I realize that at this point in time, there are probably a number of you out there that are thinking about a 1080 followed by a McTwist in a half pipe as an extreme event. And there may be others out there that are, are uh, thinking that, boy, the time we hacked into that computer at Federal Organization XYZ, that was extreme. Well, unfortunately, those are not extreme events in the world that I live in. But uh, let me share with you what are. Uh, an earthquake in Turkey in 1999 that caused this to happen to the building in the center of the picture is an extreme event in my world. Um, I will point out that if you look actually at the building, you'll notice that not a pane of glass is broken. But uh, uh, nonetheless, that's obviously not a functional building anymore. An earthquake in India in 2001. The result of this, it would actually appear that the piece that should have fallen off the top during the earthquake um, uh, remains in place, and yet other parts of the structure uh, have clearly uh, ceased to serve their function. Not all extreme events in my world are natural. Uh, the the uh, attacks at the World Trade Center in my world is an extreme event, and it's an extreme event in the, in the consequence of, of, of many, many factors that occur as a result of that. Another extreme event in my world is the earthquake that occurred in China in 2008. And I show this particular uh, uh, image because that uh, area between the two buildings prior to the earthquake was level. And you can now see that the building on the right hand side is about two meters higher than the one on the left. And in fact, the thrust fault which produced that offset. And surprisingly though, the buildings are still standing. Another extreme event, and the last one I'll show at this stage, is the, Chile, the earthquake that occurred in Chile a little over two months ago. And um, uh, in this particular case, obviously significant distress to a highway embankment. Um, uh, I selected these particular ones. Um, I've had the opportunity to go and observe all of these extreme events. These are not images that I've captured off the web. They are part of the experience portfolio that I've had and that gets me here today. So now, let's come back and let's add a little focus to this talk though because I don't want you to think that all you're gonna see is another five or eight minutes of extreme event images for me. Um, that being said, to me, extreme events are what I call rare, um, unpredictable by and large, and with very dramatic consequences both in terms of infrastructure and in terms of human casualties. And at the same token, they produce amazing experiences. And I know that because every time I go to one of these events and undertake the work that I do, um, uh, I think I'm a tough guy. Uh, I know I'm not in the zone until I've had that one moment where I've had to go off and think about it. And so the experiences are incredible. And at the same token, I think that combination of extreme events and experiences is something that is a huge opportunity for education. And in fact, I have tried to some extent to, to, to leverage that opportunity over the years, but uh, as recently as two weeks ago, uh, I, I've even uh, begun to realize I can do a much better job at that. Let me also just quickly put out a couple of constructs. And we're not gonna have the time today to really dig into all of these. But any time I approach something of this nature, I always take a, an approach that I said, what are some questions worth asking? Everything for me has to begin with questions. I, I hate to accept something or make an assumption at the start. At that point in time, uh, hopefully into the questions, we may identify some ideas worth pursuing. Um, and if we pursue those, then maybe we identify some changes worth making. And maybe ultimately, if we've made those changes, then we end up with some experiences worth sharing. Um, I could start off right now, and by the way, ask you sort of a series of questions. So what's so cool about 15 week semesters, 10 week quarters, uh, one hour lab, or one hour classes, uh, three hour labs, uh, textbooks, uh, quizzes, homeworks, you name it. Well, the truth of the matter is, 
they are all process vestiges from another time. And quite frankly, a number of them, if not most of them, have outlived their valuable life. And yet somehow, we don't seem to ask the question, why are we using that? Why are we doing this? Why are we that? And so as soon as you don't ask the question and you remain locked in with those, your degrees of freedom to be a change agent, to be an implementer of change, is dramatically reduced. I will ask one more question. Have you ever heard a student say to a teacher after a lecture, that was a life-changing experience? Now, I see a few smiles and a few chuckles around here because we actually also think, oh yeah, let me tell you about it. I went to sleep in that one and, and I did something else. And I'm, truth is, I'm asking the question in the positive sense. I'm saying, have you really ever heard a student come out of something like that and say, that was a life-changing experience? And the reality is, is that I think if you took the best lecturer in the world and so on and so forth, it may be very difficult to do that in some of our traditional environments and some of our traditional conditions. So let's take that as a little bit of a challenge. Now, again, if we want to look for some catalysts for changing how we do education, what are some of the key ingredients? Well, I actually think it's a fairly simple thing. I'm not going to talk in detail about all of these, but I'm going to start with the participants. Um, and, and I'm going to tell you a little story because I think it, it uh, explains um, very nicely. Uh, the participants in education need to be two people, an educator and an educatee, a teacher and a teachee. Uh, 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 that's the relationship. It's a person-to-person -person relationship. When we started our campus here, and we knew that distance learning was going to be a part of um, our uh, uh, activities, you could have put what I knew about distance learning on the head of a pin, and you'd have still had a lot of room for, uh, for other information. And so uh, I did the logical thing. I went out and asked the experts. And so I met with various people, and they told me, oh yeah, well, what you need to do, you need this piece of technology, and then they blah, 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 blah. And they talked about what's at the end, and what's at the pipe, and all that. So we went out, and we did that very well. And sat back and said, wow, we've got a great system here. And then we started to use it. And then we quickly realized, we asked the question which we thought we were supposed to ask, but it wasn't the right question. Because we asked how do you connect two classrooms? And we did that very well. But what we didn't ask was how do you connect a teacher with a student when they're 250 miles apart? And as soon as we asked that question, we came back and we changed an awful lot of things. We changed a lot of things in the classroom. We changed a lot of how we, we facilitated communication between a teacher and a student. Uh, and we, in fact, even added some other physical infrastructure because we realized distributed education needed more than just two classrooms. It needed other environments that are part of that relationship. And I still think today we're doing a much better job. We are not there yet, trust me, because new opportunities and, and new approaches are emerging all the time. But I do think one of the things we're, we're trying to do very well is to really stay right on that, that, that leading curve. The next two bullets on my slide here are information and communication, and I'd love to talk to you for about half an hour about each of those as well. I'm not going to, but those are two things that I think in today's education we are completely missing the boat on. We, we make little efforts here and there, but the manner in which we now deal with the amazing amount of information we have and bring it usefully into the, into the instructional world, and also the manner, by the way, quite frankly, in which we communicate. We've heard some neat and interesting ways today that we could perhaps change how we communicate. Um, so those are two of the other elements. The last one I am going to talk a bit more about, and that's the environments. And I've kind of upfront questioned classrooms, labs, and things like that. So in order to talk about environment, let me take you back to my extreme event world. Um, the building on the top left, uh, the collapse part, this is from the earthquake in India. That is a five-story middle school building that collapsed, and there was a large number of students killed in that event. The building on the top right is an apartment, six-story six apartment building that has collapsed. The building, uh, the, sorry, the bottom right is showing you uh, a small village in India uh, made of adobe buildings, and you can see that the earthquake essentially leveled the entire village. And finally, on the bottom left is uh, actually it's a hospital. Uh, sorry, a, a hotel in, also in India, and one wing didn't collapse, the wing on the right did collapse, they were identical wings, 
There's actually a very good seismic reason as to why one collapsed and one didn't. However, I will note that we declined the offer to stay in the half that was still standing up. <laughs> the next set of slides um, show you something else. Many of you have probably heard people describing earthquakes as events where two plates are sliding relative to each other. And that sounds fine, but in fact, when you see that in reality, it leaves quite an impression. The upper left, is that guardrail used to be a nice straight line. You can see it's now got a nice S bend in it. The top right, those trees were actually all planted in a single line. The earthquake occurred, and now they've got a nice eight foot offset from the front four to the rest of the picture. Below that, if you think that that's how they make railway lines in other countries, think again. That was a straight railway line. Uh, the metal is obviously a very ductile piece of the rails, and so you can, you can see the, the, the conflict of behaviors. And the bottom right of the picture, that also is not a traffic calming measure. That used to be a straight road, and you can now see there's a very nice offset. One of the things about earthquakes is that they're not always limited to the main event. That triggers something. But subsequent to that, many other things can happen. The upper left shows uh, the remnants of a landslide that caused a quake lake. And so once the quake level, the water level in the lake rose, it overtopped. And then it caused a, a whole series of additional challenges and problems downstream, and in some casualties in some case. The three other images in that particular slide are showing not landslides that occurred during the earthquake, but in fact, landslides that were triggered by rainfall, heavy rainfall, kind of uh, thematic right now here, uh, right after the earthquake. The last set of slides I have of images here, the bottom left is obviously something that probably looks fairly familiar to it. It's what happens when a tsunami comes in and picks a building up and moves it uh, somewhere else. And similarly, the picture above that showing four boats uh, high and dry, literally they were picked up by the tsunami, moved inland and dropped. Now, as you look at the picture on the right, you may say, oh, that's more. Those boats were also lifted up and moved, moved inland. Uh, the truth of the matter is no. Those, bo those boats were moored there the night before. And when the earthquake came, the, the uplift that occurred raised that land up about two meters. And so the tide is no longer coming into that part of the river. And in fact, if you look in the image below on the right, uh, you'll actually see me standing next to a rock that has a sort of a light gray part, a brown part, and a gray part on top. Well, the light gray is what, this was taken, by the way, at high tide. High tide is no longer coming up there. So the light gray is, was what used to be always covered, even at low tide. The brown is the region in between low tide and high tide. And above that is actually what used to be above water at high tide. So you can see that, that there's a, 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 a tremendous opportunity to observe what actually happens in some of these events. Um, and it, so it's not all about collapsing buildings, it's about many other components as well. Um, as I said, I've been very fortunate, I really consider it to have been a, an amazing opportunity for my career to be able to go and visit these places to lead teams. Uh, typically, we're actually funded by the National Science Foundation to, to make these, so it's not just uh, our, our own interest. And uh, also, we've actually taken students with us on many of these trips because I think it's an incredible experience for them. In fact, my first experience was when I was a graduate student and I was taken by a couple of professors. It left such an impression on me that I always felt I needed to do more. Well, that being said, um, Earthquakes or these events happen on a sparse basis quite often, and it's not always the easiest to get there, and there's certainly a high hazard environment as well. And so at the same token, recognizing the, the value of these experiences, um, I've sort of begun to evolve the thought of creating what I'm calling experience studioscapes. Now let me explain a little bit about why I sort of picked that title. First of all, um, everything about me and why I'm here today some, some, some impact of all the experiences I've had, going back to being a child in Ireland and working in Canada in the Arctic and, and doing many, many other exciting things, none of which I could have predicted, but as soon as I've had the experiences, trust me, they're a part of everything that I do moving forward. Um, secondly, to me, what is most important when you get into and you, and you want to educate, and education is not just about a teacher and a student. It can be two colleagues working together and one who has a different set of experiences than another. So education can happen anytime, anywhere, in any manner. But 
what I think is important is the concept that uh, there is still need, need for some form of a, uh, of a uh, formality to it. And I actually personally, even though it's never a term you will find necessarily in an engineering school, the term studio for me is wonderful because I think it uh, talks about a space with some boundary defined but with immense flexibility to move around and to interact. People can interact, you can pull things out, you, it's not you know, all lecture seats and it's not all this and that. It's a very flexible space. So I like that idea. And finally, the last part of the word escapes. To me, the experience is not about looking at the computer, but rather being immersed right in the experience. And so the concept of it being somehow related to a landscape, a much bigger entity, we're just a small little part of it. That, I think, creates a huge part of it. This image is of the town of Beshuan in northern China. It was actually up at the top, north, northwest end of the rupture that occurred um, um, in 2008, May 12, 2008. Um, the, uh, there was obviously, as you can see in the image, large scale damage to buildings. There was a landslide on the left hand side that came down and resulted in 1,600 casualties. And there was a landslide on the right hand side, which is known as Beshuan Middle School landslide, where there were 700 casualties. Uh, this was a town that was absolutely devastated by this event. Uh, the bridge was knocked out, and you can probably see that in the image as well. What you probably don't haven't picked up yet is. This picture was taken two weeks ago. I had the opportunity to go back to Szechuan province and I took this picture. In fact, the town of Szechuan is still closed to the public. Uh, and we couldn't even get near it two years ago. Uh, today, the only reason we were, were able to get there was some people we had worked to, with two years ago actually made a special request and got us access to the city. And so uh, we took this image on our way in. But once we got into the city, we suddenly saw things like this. This building with the orange columns actually settled significantly uh, during the earthquake. It didn't collapse or fall over. It settled and, and then remained in place. The building here, there used to be one more floor at the ground floor level of that building and that collapsed during the earthquake. Uh, but, but amazingly again, no glass broken in the, in the building and it actually, while on a tilt, has remained in place. What the Chinese government has planned to do with this city is to convert it to a museum. And uh, they they're actively have been uh, stabilizing unstable buildings such as this. Um, and, and so they've, they, they've begun the process of creating a museum. However, to me, it was much more than a museum. I, certainly, I think it's an absolutely wonderful museum, but it's much more. Uh, because it's not only about the, the buildings. This particular image, um, there's the toe of one of the landslides in the background of the image, and the green grassy area on the bottom right of the image with the cypress trees around it is a mass grave for many of the people who were killed in the city as a result of the earthquake. Uh, it is impossible to share with you the feelings that you have when you're in this location. But let me tell you, uh, experienced as I am in, in going to some of these very harsh environments, this was a life-changing experience for me. Uh, the music that was playing in the background, uh, as you looked all around you, time had literally stopped for two years, at least that's how it appeared. Nothing had been changed, everything had been preserved. And you know, part of what I immediately began to recognize and realize, I think sometimes we actually try to artificially cure and we say, oh gosh, let's move all vestiges of this, and we clean it up to one, and let's move on. Well, you know what? Sometimes that may not be such a good idea. And being able to come back and thoughtfully reflect not only on what happened, but on the future and how we can avoid it, I think is something very important that we can do. The, um, uh, so I left there certainly changed and with a very rich experience. But to be honest, what was even more striking to me was two days later, one of the students who was with me sent me an email. This is what it said. And that has changed me even more, that email in the last two weeks, because I've suddenly realized there's so much more that I can do to not just make these extreme events, catastrophic events and events that should be forgotten, 
but rather events that create experiences that can enhance education, that can mitigate or minimize the future of these uh, events. Let me leave you with one last quote. The Irish poet William Butler Yeats said, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. I think at times we spend far too much time well-intentioned but filling pails and not lighting fires. Thank you very much.